So uh, just good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Atlanta Economics Club September webinar. Today's talk is going to cover trends in commercial real estate, which has been a pretty hot topic uh, during the pandemic. I looked over the registration list for today. I saw a lot of familiar names. So for everybody that's a regular attendee at these AEC events, welcome back. It's been a long summer. Uh, but for the first time attendees, I hope you enjoy everything that we share today. And you're always welcome to come back for our next event uh, next month or, or in the future. Um, as a reminder, just uh, just put all the questions in uh, for Q&A uh, just in the chat. Um, and we'll try and leave 15 minutes or so at the end of the event for some questions with Richard. Before we get started, just a couple of quick club announcements uh, and some club business. Um, a quick reminder that the, the, the National Association for Business Economists annual meeting is taking place in a couple of weeks on the 26th. I know a lot of you guys are attending that in person. And so if, you know, if you're going in person, you probably have all your travel plans set and everything like that. Uh, if you want to attend virtually, keep in mind that that event is free for uh, NAVE members. So if you already have a NAVE membership, you want to see uh, some of the program, uh, you can register for free just at the NAVE website. Um, I, I don't think the entire event is free, but I, I believe you get to see like all of the all of the sort of the full attendee sessions. So you don't get to see the breakout sessions that are, are going to occur during the, the during the meeting, but you do get to see like the, the main keynote speakers. Um, as for our own meetings, the, the AAC board met over the summer. We decided that we were going to continue with this virtual format, uh, at least through the end of this calendar year. You know, we, we had been toying around with this with the idea of doing hybrid events or starting to bring people back in person. Um, but I think with the spread of the, the Delta variant, we just decided in the interest of safety uh, to continue with this with this virtual format, like getting together in big indoor gatherings really didn't seem like the move. So we're gonna continue to monitor the virus and variant situation. We'll reevaluate as we get new information. But for now, at least for the remainder of this year, uh, through, through the end of 2021, expect that all of these meetings are gonna be virtual um, until, further until further notice. Uh, connected to this, all of the individual membership fees are gonna be continued to, to be waived. Uh, this is a practice that we started last uh, during last year's program when we decided to switch over to virtual. Um, there's no more individual uh, membership fees until we start you know, resuming these in-person luncheons. Uh, with that said, I'd, lo I'd love to uh, just take a, a little bit of time to say thank you to our corporate members. Uh, their support has been pretty critical in allowing us to provide these virtual events and also continue the, the, the AAC scholarship um, so a big thank you to, to all of the corporate members that have, that have helped us uh, during this time. Lastly, um, one of the new initiatives that the AEC has, has, has begun this year uh, has been to try and continue to make more connections with the student population here in, in the Atlanta area. And so our past president, Jessica Adil, decided to spearhead just a collaboration with uh, some of the local colleges and universities uh, that we formed the Economic Collaborative of Atlanta Area Academic Institutions or the ECOAAAI. Uh, they, they kicked off this partnership with a, uh, with a series of events during this fall semester. So there's a, a, quite a few events that we have scheduled over the next couple of months. We actually had the first event um, uh, just last week uh, talking about sort of, you know, what uh, how economics is, has benefited some recent graduates. And, and from my understanding, it, it, it went really well. Student engagement is one of Jessica's passions. Uh, it's something that when she was president, she tried to push for. I'm, I'm hoping to continue some of that over the next couple of years. And I'm pretty excited to see where she and Jael and, and the other board members that are active in that are, are, are able to take it. Uh, so with that said, I don't want to waste uh, too much time here. But I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Richard Barkham. Uh, who joined CBRE in 2014 as an executive director and global Thank chief economist. He's based out of our Boston offices. Uh, and as, C as CBRE's global head of research, he leads a team of 700 researchers worldwide, worldwide covering uh, global real estate trends. Uh, he, he travels quite a bit and, and uh, speaks extensively on, on real estate movements. Uh, also the chairman of CBRE's econometric advisors, which is a specialist real estate forecasting unit. He has a number of academic and trade press publications to his credit, uh, including uh, Real Estate and Globalization, which is a highly regarded book that talks about the rise of emerging markets and the impact on real estate. He's a visiting pro professor of economics at the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London, and he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Reading. Uh, commercial real estate has been uh, pretty significantly affected by the pandemic. 
And so I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to have him on to talk a bit about uh, the impact on the various commercial real estate sectors, uh, what it's done to, to commercial real estate and what we can expect going forward. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Richard, take it away. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, so when I share my slides, you'll see I've got the closed captioning on. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit irritating, it doesn't exactly always reflect what I've said, I've found, but um, just um, listen to what I'm saying rather than read it, if you don't mind. Secondly, um, I've got uh, a, um, a macro section at the start of my presentation. I'm going to go, most of you will be familiar with that. I'm going to go very quickly, but it is just, it's, I find it very convenient to put it in. It's just a way of limbering up. Um, uh, so uh, bear with that. Uh, I'll do that quickly and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of uh, what's going on in the US real estate right now. So without further ado, this is my economic and market uh, presentation. So let's start off, um, you know, where most of us have been starting off over the last 18 months with just a review of the, the virus situation and a very promising um, kind of uh, economic surge uh, in the United States due to policy and due to the effects of uh, uh, reopening, um, you know, has somewhat uh, been slowed by the COVID headwind. Um, and, uh, you know, this, but the, the kind of, the, I think there's relatively good news coming out of that. It's, it's certainly going to have effects on Q3 and Q4. Um, the economy was uh, likely slowing anyway, but this is a headwind. I'm pleased to see, I think, that new confirmed cases seem to have peaked, um, and I expect that to continue to decline. Um, the US, as I had hoped, hasn't quite broken the link between uh, COVID cases and the COVID death rate, um, but it's substantially better than it was. I think the UK looks much better in terms of uh, uh, breaking the link between infections and the death rate. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there is hope there, but that, you know, depends on, on the rollout of vaccination and, and all the rest of it. But in any case, point is, uh, you know, there was a, a big uh, Q3 headwind uh, to the US economy. Um, and so everybody has revised, you know, this was the uh, situation, um, you know, in July, uh, with all the major forecast houses uh, forecasting 7.3% GDP growth um, in the US economy for 2021. Um, that's all come down pretty sharply to 5.8. Um, I don't see too much further revision going on, uh, but definitely um, y y y people are revising their forecasts uh, because of the COVID uh, headwind. Um, it's not the only thing that we know is affecting uh, the, you know, the revisions to the forecasts. The other is, of course, uh, supply chain issues. Um, this is a nice chart of unfulfilled uh, uh, um, orders in uh, consumer durables. Um, so, you know, that doesn't look like it's going to ease very quickly. That's another headwind for the uh, economy. Uh, and of course, uh, a, a final headwind would be the, you know, super tight. I, I put it in inverted commas because it, um, there are funny things going on in the labour market. I don't know if this is classically super tight, but it appears kind of uh, super tight, you know, with lots of job openings there um, and people struggling to hire, I think, across the board. So they're all headwinds um, for the US economy, which means that the the, the, the likely we're going to go into a growth lull, I think, over the next six to 12 months. I don't think it's going to uh, lead to a recession. That's not our house view at all. Um, you know, you will all have noticed, um, uh, you know, uh, business investment capex is surging in a, in a quite remarkable way. Um, so uh, you've got that impetus. And of course, although consumer spending will be impacted, I think, by the COVID headwind. Um, I do expect consumer spending to continue to, uh, you know, drive the economy, uh, albeit at a kind of uh, a, a, a reduced rate over the next six to nine months. Um, elsewhere in the world, um, you, you, we've got a kind of mixed picture developing. Um, uh, business confidence seems to be easing, particularly in the service sector. I mean, that I think reflects a slowdown uh, in the United States economy. It's, it's not the only thing that it reflects, but you can see that, um, and you can cer certain parts, uh, the, the maybe slightly worrying, uh, 
business confidence in Chinese services uh, 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 heading down. Um, and also note, um, but you know, Europe has been always expected uh, the US to drive growth in 2021 and Europe to take over in 2022. Um, it's happening a bit sooner than we expected, but you know, uh, confidence in Europe um, actually is uh, on the increase and um, economic forecasts in Europe are actually being uh, revised up. Um, you can see that Europe has taken over from the United States in terms of uh, the vaccination. The vaccination rollout in Europe has been uh, you know, very successful, really. Um, and that's part of the reason, of course, that, that confidence is up and forecasts are being re revised up in Europe. Um, but uh, the other thing I think, and everybody will be noticing this as well, the, the, the outlook for the Chinese economy has become quite uncertain following that, you know, that surge, that reopening surge, that policy surge. Um, you, you know, you've certainly got a COVID lockdown effect hitting Chinese consumption in Q3. But you've got to think that the, the kind of rather chaotic um, regulatory surge that's taking place in China um, is also affecting confidence as well. So um, we'll all have noticed, and we might want to come back to it in question, you know, the problems of the, the really hyper, hyper indebted um, Evergrande um, Chinese developer um, seems to be running into. Um, you know, I suspect that will be, you know, there's enough political will to manage that, uh, the balance sheet adjustment that needs to take place with that company. Uh, but it is, um, it may not be well handled and it could get quite messy. So the outlook, I would say, for China is darkening a little bit. But overall, um, global growth, I think, is going to slow over the next six to 12 months. Um, you know, stock markets uh, are reflecting that, trading sideways and down a little bit, but probably not enough to, uh, you know, to think about uh, onset of any sort of new recession. Um, you know, we just don't see that happening at all. In any case, that's the, that's the macro context in, in which we have to look at uh, real estate. So let's turn now to real estate fundamentals. Uh, and it's a very interesting story. Um, so let's look first at the industrial uh, and logistics sector. Um, and, you know, one of the, the concepts that we rely on in real estate is, is, is net absorption. So you know, the real estate market is, is kind of highly dynamic. You know, firms are leaving space and firms are taking on space uh, the whole time. Um, but you know, what we're looking at is the balance between firms shedding space and firms taking space. Uh, and we call that net absorption. And positive net absorption means that vacancy is going down. Uh, and it means that, you know, on balance, firms are acquiring uh, more space uh, than they are shedding. And, you know, this is a really remarkable story in the industrial logistics sector. I think everybody will understand the background to it. Um, industrial and, and um, logistics as a sector has been you know, really, the, uh, the I, I don't know how to, to put it, just the strongest sector in commercial real estate globally, uh, at least, um, you know, since 2008, 2009, since we came out of the, um, the, uh, the, the Great Recession, it really took off um, sort of uh, in, in the middle of the decade, around 2015, um, posting, you know, uh, uh, you know, a long, period of positive net absorption. Um, and you can see that, you know, even in the teeth of the, uh, the pandemic, you know, didn't, there's, the sector didn't even seem to, to break step. Um, and of course, behind that is the, the shift in um, uh, consumer spending to e-commerce and the kind of uh, you know, the way in which goods are kind of distributed. Uh, missing out conventional shops and going straight from the warehouse really is, is kind of what's what's driven that. Um, and you can see uh, the fact that the, the, the policy response around the world, but also in the States, put a lot of money in people's pockets. And they weren't able to uh, spend that on services, so spend it on goods. Uh, and a lot of those goods have been distributed through the, um, uh, the industrial and logistics sector. So you know, um, uh, uh, industrial and logistics. Now, I'll come back to values, you know, what, what the investment side, what people are, you know, people who don't use real estate but invest in it are, 
uh, pricing uh, uh, industrial at uh, in a moment or two. But the fundamentals are extremely strong. Um, and, you know, we seem to be generating two to 300 million square feet of net absorption per annum, um, which is just a, a huge number. And you see uh, COVID has probably given this, you know, a little bit of a boost. Um, uh, 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 that that sh that that should ease, but it's still um, um, the industrial sector is still going to be benefit from the long term uh, trend towards uh, e-commerce. Moving on, um, uh, having a look at uh, multifamily, um, multifamily uh, net absorption. Um, I mean that's slipped a little bit. I think over the course of COVID, um, as people kind of moved out of the uh, large cities. Um, and we've seen a trend towards the suburbs. Um, but um, since May this year, it's been an extremely positive letting season in, in the multifamily sector, uh, even in the larger cities. So uh, multifamily also, um, it, never, it never moved into negative net absorption territory. Um, but uh, um, what we've seen is a you know, positive strong availability remains quite low. Um, if we move on, you know, one of the more surprising uh, results uh, in terms of uh, real estate fundamentals is just retail net absorption. You can see how badly that was. Um, uh, I, I, you may just have, um, I, I saw my internet connection had gone uh, a little bit uh, funny there. So um, I, I one of the more surprising um, features of the, the current real estate landscape is just how positive retail net absorption has gone. Um, you can see how badly it was impacted uh, over the course of the uh, COVID crisis, but it has bounced back quite strongly. Um, and I think it's worth remembering when you're thinking about retail, you know, retail is, is not just malls, it's not just high streets. Uh, the majority of retail is kind of strip centers uh, and it's kind of neighborhood grocery anchored um, uh, uh, you know smaller uh, kind of complexes um, you know and I think that the, the trend to working at home and the trend to the suburbs has given uh, retail something of a boost in any case you know the point is that um, you know the the recovery is underway quite strongly in those three sectors um, of uh, the real estate market, industrial logistics, multifamily, uh, and retail. All, all of those sectors have returned to positive net absorption. And indeed, industrial logistics um, hardly broke step. But it's a different sector, a different uh, situation in the office sector. Um, you can see that the office sector has been kind of quite hard hit by the COVID, um, you know, with, the, with actually the success of people working from home um, has led, uh, and also a degree of corporate caution. Um, I think all of the people have very many natural fears about COVID, uh, but I think also, you know, somehow corporate America's response has amplified those fears. With all manner of protocols, uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, uh, uh, put in place, uh, you know, to allow people to come back into the office, uh, but actually probably having the the reverse effect of putting people off from coming back into the office. Um, and the point is, uh, you know, whilst there is this uncertainty about how people are going to work, then um, clearly companies have been rethinking their space plans um, and you can see that you know over the last six months conditions in um, office real estate were improving so you can see that negative net absorption was relatively small in q2 and we were expecting um, positive net absorption to, to 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 kick in in q3 and q4 I suspect the covid surge is as has delayed the the recovery, if you want to call it that, uh, in the uh, office sector um, for another couple of quarters. We're hearing a lot now about 
companies really putting off a, a whole scale return to work um, or return to the office, you know, until after Christmas. So um, we will see how that goes. And, and in the context of a slowing economy as well, um, you know, it may well be that that return to positive net absorption is, is delayed at a couple of quarters. And you can see this had a, a pretty significant impact on the vacancy rate in this sector. Um, it was uh, previously just below 12, which is the kind of long-term average um, uh, over the modern period. And it's bounced up to 15%. Uh, and in those conditions, you, you won't see any rental growth in the sector. Um, you know, rents are generally speaking in fact, you know, uh, headline rents, we, we, headline rents have, have kind of somewhat held stable, but the incentives that are required uh, in terms of tenant improvement allowances, in terms of rent free periods, they have substantially increased uh, across the marketplace. Uh, and what that means, of course, is the, the kind of real net effective rent has dropped quite sharply. Uh, in the office sector, and we don't really expect it to to go positive, you know, for 24, 36 months. Um, you know, you've got to you, firstly you've got to turn uh, net absorption positive, then you've got to get that vacancy rate. What I would say though is um, this is not a sector as in previous recessions that is particularly oversupplied. I mean that vacancy rate is high and. There was a, 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 a wave of completions um, in 2021 and 2022, but this is not a gross avalanche of new space that we might have seen in, in kind of previous recessions. Um, in fact, you know, I think also I would say the, uh, the, the impetus for development has in the office sector has obviously disappeared. Um, and I think we might find ourselves in, in two uh, to three years time with a, a shortage of, um, you know, what we call prime grade space or the, the latest, newest, best offices. Um, uh, you know, when the, when the kind of office sector picks up uh, to some sort of new normal, um, then, you know, there will be a dearth of, of, of new product on the market. So um, we'll see probably, you know, from 2024, um, you know, quite a polarized market, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, rental growth coming back into some of the primer and newer sectors. In any case, that's that's the kind of fundamentals, um, or a, a kind of a pen picture of the, the fundamentals in real estate. Uh, let me now just dig a bit more into the office sector because, it, you know, it, unsurprisingly, it's something that we've um, you know we've done quite a lot of research on. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an important part of our business, so we, we kind of keep our ears to the ground. Um, so let's just dig into, you know, the kind of longer term issues uh, surrounding um, uh, the return to the office. So this is, um, uh, you know, the people who do the swipe cards as you, as you go into the, um, into the office, the castle data systems. This kind of quite a good benchmark of what's going on in the in the office sector right now. It's uh, it, it is it shows uh, uh, office occupancy. Uh, it shows a couple of things that you know worth looking at. Just the you know you can see the big drop in occupancy uh, that was taking place uh, that took place uh, you know after the crisis uh, first hit. You could see that kind of gently. Um, people were coming back to the office. It was, you know, they're not rushing back. You would sit, you know, as I've, I've explained for a variety of reasons, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but they were beginning to come back uh, with perhaps the, uh, the, the, the metros that are most, are least dependent on mass transit um, being, uh, you know, the closest to get back, you know, the quickest to get back. Uh, and the, the metros are the most dependent on met, uh, on mass transit being the slowest. But you can see that, you know, what's happened, and it's, I, I mentioned it earlier, that the COVID, the, the Delta surge that we've seen over the last quarter or so, has clearly been a headwind for the, the office sector. So we've seen those kind of rates of occupancy going down again. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, I, I expect that to reverse. Um, but of course, we'll have to see those case rates uh, in COVID going down before that happens. Um, 
just talking, it's been one of the things, you know, in following the sector, um, I've been quite interested. I mean, the, the, the kind of central markets, the big markets are, you know, quite dependent on mass transit. And I, you know, I think I've been thinking to myself that the reluctance to use public transport, uh, transportation that we see around the world was one of the things we had to overcome that before we got people back into the uh, office. Um, and you can see kind of this is a, a, a ridership of the New York uh, Metro you know, gradually creeping back. And, you know, in my own mind, I'd formed a view that, you know, who wants to get onto a crowded Metro in a, in a pandemic? No, nobody really wants to do that. But it's quite interesting. Um, if you look at the UK, um, my friends in the UK in London are telling me that, I mean, it, we've got the same um, kind of broad pattern in mass transit ridership. Uh, but my friends tell me that, that the, Met, uh, the tube, the London tube is actually packed at the weekends. So, you know, you begin to think, well, is it really reluctance to rely uh, to, to, um, to, to, to get onto the metro? Um, and, and others have, have pointed out, you know, bars and restaurants are actually jam-packed. Um, sporting venues are jam-packed. So kind of is it fear of COVID that's holding people going back from the office to the office? I'm not so certain that that's true anymore. Um, you know, people seem perfectly ready to, 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 to get together. Um, they just don't seem to want to go back to the office. So here's a, a survey that um, was uh, completed, I think, in December 2020. It's a little bit out of date, but it does show you, I think, you know, why why are people why are people not going back to the office? Um, I think there's a, there is a big issue around um, childcare responsibilities. We've seen that, and we've seen that in the kind of labour participation rates for for uh, people with childcare responsibilities. So that that is a real issue that should that should ease going forward, um, and then you've got the kind of concerns about the coronavirus. Um, well, that's what what people are saying. Uh, I have reason to suspect that that's not as bad as it kind of you know people are making out. People are learning to live with with the with the virus, um, and certainly there seems you know plenty of appetite, as I say, to to travel uh, and to congregate. Um, so people are saying that. I'm not certain that is the full answer. But then you've got this, you've got this kind of attitude shift here. People prefer working from home. Um, and, you know, it's been kind of facilitated by the, the, the technological change um, that was happening prior to COVID coming about. But the widespread adoption of remote working facilitated by technology such as Zoom um, you know, have allowed people's attitudes to change uh, to the world of work. Um, I would say probably, um, I wouldn't, you know, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take something um, uh, to, to, to get people to go back to the office. Some, it's going to have to, there's going to have to be some, you know, some nudge, I think, uh, to, to people to get them to go back to the office because uh, there's definitely uh, preferences set in for working uh, from home. Now, I don't think, I wouldn't overinterpret this because we're living in a very false environment, as, as you well know. You know, we're in one which is kind of absurd, absurd, absurdly kind of um, inflated by fiscal and monetary policy. Um, so of a kind that we haven't seen, um, you know, for a long while. So, you know, there is a level of security in the, in the labour market, in the, in the working world that I think, I'd, you know, is not going to last. So it'll be a different situation when companies really have to hustle for business and people really have to hustle, you know, for their kind of place in the work and, and strive to get on. So I don't, I wouldn't want to overinterpret that, uh, but there definitely does seem to be a, an attitudinal change, um, you know, on the part of, uh, of uh, American service sector workers. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, the working from home, the remote working seems to be kind of reasonably successful. Um, so we'll see how that pans out. I expect, you know, I still expect the majority of service sector workers to be uh, 
spend the majority, maybe not the vast majority, but the majority of their time back in the office when the, the full effects of policy and COVID have, uh, 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 have um, played out. Um, but for the time being, um, you know, it's going to be, that's going to be a relatively slow uh, evolution, I think. Um, just moving on to this question, I mean, we've tried to quantify this, uh, this remote working. What does it mean uh, for actual overall demand for offices? Um, so, you know, all of the services, surveys that we see out there at the moment um, uh, seem to indica indicate that um, the average US employee, if we cut it all up, will spend 24% less time working in the office. So that's not dropping off a cliff, but it, you know, broadly speaking, you know, American workers, uh, workers around the world would have spent maybe four days in the office uh, pre-COVID, probably going down to three, something like that in those, that type of order. Um, but uh, so what does that actually mean for overall demand for office is one thing that we've been trying to, to grapple with. Of course, 24% less time in the office doesn't necessarily mean you know, 24% less office is required. Um, you know, there is much more to consider. Um, you have to, you have to consider, ooh, hang on a sec. Um, you know, this is, this is what we're saying, that the average worker employee will, will had been working 4.4 days uh, per week in the office, going down to 3.35. Now, there's a thing in, uh, called peak loading, and it kind of, uh, if everybody who's working in the office, you know, comes in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, um, you've still got to have an office that uh, uh, um, uh, is able to house that kind of workforce and that kind of collaboration. Um, so the ability to uh, gain um, kind of office space savings, um, uh, you know, that theoretically are available by people being less in the office, um, we, we call that the efficiency, efficiency factor. Now, we don't think that companies will be able to capture all of that 24% uh, uh, reduction in space. We think, you know, at best, they'll capture 50% of that, um, uh, you know, in terms of being able to reduce space. And then I think uh, there's another uh, factor that we build into this uh, densification or de-densification. Prior to COVID, we saw a huge increase in densification of office, people working in Kind of much much uh, uh, closer proximity, um, and I, I think for uh, you know for the time being that the densifi that densification uh, not only has come to a halt, but it's probably going into reverse as well. So and it's not just a COVID effect or, or a wellness effect, although that is part of it. it. It's also the way in which offices are evolving. You know, away from kind of massed banks of desks with people basically paper factories, just a kind of factory version of the service sector towards kind of much more collaborative. And if you look at trends in, in the, the, the US service sector, you know, the elimination of the kind of uh, lower, lower level jobs, the shipping out of the lower level jobs to, um, uh, you know, places like the Philippines uh, and, uh, and India means that, you know, offices, office work is itself becoming more intellectual in nature um, and that right the point is that requires quite a lot of meeting rooms and quite a lot of meeting rooms means more space per worker so you get a reversal uh, for a number of factors in the densification of offices in any case if you pull all of that together you get to this point um, hang on a sec. You know, let's just take an average firm to 100,000 uh, square foot lease um, at, you know at, at Average days in the office of 4.4, uh, future 4.35, you know, potentially uh, at least, you know, you can cut that lease down to 7,600 square feet. Um, but actually, you know, you need to uh, uh, take into account of the, uh, the efficiency factor. You can't uh, capture all of that. So actually, it's not 7,600 square feet. You know, you might get it down to 800. 8,700 square feet. Um, but then you've got, you know, some impact from de-densification, which means all you, the overall net impact um, is likely to be uh, around 9 or 10% reduction in the demand for space. So 
for a theoretical company uh, where you know people are working less in the office, um, but you can't capture all of that, and there is some de-densification uh, effect going on. So that 24% uh, decline in space in the office, we think translates to around a 9% reduction um, in demand for office space. Now, that is a kind of ceteris paribus type of analysis. Uh, we know that other thing that you know this is if nothing changes you know is in other words is the is that you know is, is 10 percent you know uh, of the us office stock currently is going to going to be vacated no we don't think so it, you know these things companies have existing lease um leases that have got to roll through before they make new um uh, you know new decisions about space but also You've got to remember that the 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 office the service sector is growing. The rate of the service sector growth or service sector jobs is not quite as as strong as it has been in the past, uh, but there will be as well some offset from just you know the pure growth in um, people employed uh, in the service sector in the office sector that we know will take place uh, over the next uh, several years. Um, so. You know, these are our assumptions. You know, the the, um, the remote working clearly going to have an impact on the uh, on the office sector, um, uh, and you know, though that vacancy rate is going to probably be elevated for three, four, five years, um, but it's not the office sector uh, you know, falling off a cliff or anything like that. And indeed, um, you know, premium good space is uh, uh, good, good, well pointed space is going to probably be in a shortage uh, before too long. Um, anyway, uh, just very quickly, I'm talking too long. Let's have a quick flick through investment activity. Um, and I'll do that, you know, um, investment activity, that's investors buying offices and, and multifamily and, and assets as a kind of bond-like substitute. Um, you can see it took a, a, a big hit in the, in the uh, 2020 when COVID hit, but has bounced back pretty strongly. Um, you know, with actually multifamily uh, is the preferred asset, but also industrial is the, the kind of those are the two um, sectors that are of real great interest to investors right now. But, you know, look, office transactions also taking place and retail uh, going up and in, uh, investors uh, uh, mines as a kind of attractive asset <coughs> as well. We've noticed that. So that's uh, investment trending back quite strongly. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, investors at the moment, you know, looking to the south. Um, it's, it's obviously the area which has kind of got the population growth. It, it seems to be the area that's bound, you know, it seems to be shrugging off COVID, um, uh, or at least attitudinally shrugging it off. But investors have, um, have uh, made a beeline for the south um, uh, in particular, but that should broaden, I think, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. This is a relationship that I quite like. This is a global CRE capital flow. So this is just read that as the number of transactions in global uh, uh, real estate. Um, and I also I superimposed on that global mergers and acquisitions. So we know that kind of uh, mergers and acquisitions have been pretty strong uh, over the last several quarters uh, for, for reasons I'm sure you're familiar with. It tends to lead um, uh, uh, commercial real estate uh, by a couple of quarters. So I expect that trend to investing uh, in uh, commercial real estate to continue uh, over the next um, 12 to 18 months. Let's have a quick look at cap rates. It's our way of uh, uh, indicating pricing in real estate. It's quite an interesting story. Here's the office cap rate. Um, you know, it's, um, this is from our kind of uh, survey of our professionals, uh, our broker professionals and our valuation professionals. Um, uh, kind of odd kink um, in, the, uh, in the COVID years. Um, but uh, a little bit of price adjustment uh, in the office sector. Um, as you might expect, as the uh, the growth prospects have, have weakened, um, so but not as much, uh, you know, and I think not as much because there is um, just there is just you know a, a, a great deal of capital 
um, uh, chasing real estate right now. So uh, maybe a little bit further um, adjustment to come, at least in certain parts of the uh, office sector. If you have a look at the industrial, I mean, uh, you know, the, the rental growth in industrial right now is about eight percent. So you know, investors are, are, are piling into industrial property. Uh, and in certain really hot markets, we're seeing uh, cap rates lower than 3%. This is an average cap rate across all grades and uh, all, um, all geographies, but the hottest markets uh, are, are sub 3%. Um, hotel cap rates, we stopped collecting cap rates in the, in the period of the crisis. There just wasn't any evidence. The hotel cap rates, um, quite stable. Uh, actually, and uh, investors quite interested in uh, uh, the the opportunities um, uh, that uh, the recovering uh, hotel sector um, uh, is uh, uh, being able to provide. But you can see there, you know, the the sector you know, suburban hotels that cater for the domestic market, you know, clearly seeing some mild compression, but the uh, the, the the CBD hotels, the, the, the full line CBD hotels that cater for you know business travelers in the big cities and tourists, clearly not quite recovered yet, and seeing a bit of cap rate decompression. Um, multifamily, you know, we've got the you can see very clearly the multi the, the the suburban, you know, the impetus, uh, you know, the, the population moving to suburban. Um, uh, locations. Um, you see it in the housing market, single family home market, you can see it in multifamily as well. Um, and just you know, a little bit of yield com compression in the retail um, sector. Um, you, you know, as I say, not all retail is malls. In fact, 80% of retail is kind of rather more prosaic, grocery anchored, you know, neighborhood shopping. Uh, and, you know, that investors are taking that offers a very, you know, good cap a good uh, cash yield um, and probably given a little bit of rental impetus, given the kind of trends uh, in uh, consumer spending um, and uh, you know, investors are, uh, are pretty interested in this right now. It's gone to the top of the agenda. Uh, REIT prices are good kind of public market signal. I think, you know, clearly, um, the, you know, this was up to a couple of days ago, uh, you know, the COVID, uh, the flare up or the, the, the current kind of weakness in the market has had some impact. Um, but broadly speaking, public, you know, public markets indicating not too much worry uh, about real estate values. Um, you can see at the bottom there, you know, offices and uh, hotels not quite fully recovered yet. Uh, but industrial and self storage and apartments, you know, fully recovered uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, the kind of public market pricing. Uh, and, you know, most other sectors, you know, nowhere near as bad as they were in the, the dark days of uh, 2020. So, conclusions, and I'll probably talk way too long. Um, uh, uh, US and Asia are slowing, Europe is picking up. The virus issues, I think, are far from over, but I think there's some good news that we are able to break the link between uh, infection rates and death rates. Um, real estate is in high demand from occupiers and investors. Um, values are very robust, but the office sector is lagging. It is likely that we are at the start of a mild secular shift. Uh, it's a bit early to be definitive on this. Uh, as I said, we live in a very false environment right now, um, one that is void up um, uh, by policy. Um, so we can't be definitive, but it does look like there is a mild secular shift uh, in the office sector taking place, not unlike the secular shift that we've seen in retail over the last 10 to 15 years. So. Um, I'm sorry I went on for too long. Um, I've at least got five minutes for questions. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Richard. That was uh, that was great stuff. Um, so I, I noticed that, that we don't have the chat enabled this time around. So what I'd ask for all people with questions and uh, questions here, if you could just go to the reactions tab and raise your hand, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend like we're in person again. Uh, and uh, I'll either unmute you or Brian will, will unmute you and you can ask your question then. Uh, I, I just have one to kick things off. Richard, one of the other sectors in commercial real estate that was hammered by the, the pandemic was the hotel sector, right? That 
that uh, travel kind of was locked down and people were, were kept inside. I was wondering sort of what your thoughts were on where the hotel sector is now. I, I assume the outlook for hotels is, is probably largely tied to the, to the, to the virus and, and progress there, but are you seeing any indications of a, of a rebound there? Yeah, I did, I did refer to that. It's a bifurcated market um, with hotels that are catering, catering for the domestic leisure market. You know, people aren't able to travel for holidays, but they can get in their car and go down the road. Um, you know, occupancy rates have recovered pretty strongly in the hotel sector uh, that caters, as I say, for domestic travel and leisure, leisure travel. Um, but the, the sector that is, uh, the hotels that are in the big cities that cater for tourists and businessmen who are traveling the full line, expensive to run hotels, they're very far from recovered right now. And you saw a little bit of that in the cap rate survey. Uh, and, but, 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 you know, we do, you know, it will recover, um, you know, uh, uh, it will recover, um, but you know those those full line, full service CBD hotels probably got another two to three years to go. Uh, so I, I I can't tell who this person's actual name is, but P L T A Y. It's Perry Taylor. Fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. To what extent is the uh, permanent change in office space utilization affected by regional trends. It occurs to me anecdotally that uh, um, in certain areas such as Silicon Valley, the Northwest Coast um, had already begun a pretty significant shift in the homework workforce uh, prior to the pandemic and the pandemic may have accelerated a permanent change. Other areas, that trend had not yet begun. So is to what extent do regional trends and industry trends affect the ultimate result of um, office space utilization? I think they 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 play a, they do definitely play a role, and I've got some slides on that. I didn't have time to show them today. Um, you know, some some sectors are more uh, uh, susceptible to, to to remote working than others. Um, I think it's, that's not the only factor. It's not just a, a, a kind of sectoral thing. I think um, commuting times are also play a role. Um, the you know the, the areas which have got longer commuting times are probably more susceptible to home working, um, and uh, you know those those kind of and there will be some differences between cities um, in you know the, the 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 trend towards remote working. Having said all of that, it's not very great. The the difference you know between the kind of regional or, or, or how we look at it, the metro level effect. It is there, you can see it. Um, uh, and the, the other thing that affects it, of course, is demographics. Um, cities with a kind of older demographic, probably more susceptible to remote working. Um, but there isn't that great of a difference between um, metro areas. There is some, but it's not very great. And those are the three factors, I think, that drive it. Thank you. Um, so I don't. I don't see any other questions. I'll ask one more before we get out of here. Richard, in the, in the office sector, I was wondering if you're noticing any differences in terms of like the types of offices and, and, and the the impact that the that the pandemic had. Like, are you are are premium spaces able to kind of hold on to demand a bit better, or are you seeing uh, just a massive flight in in those relative to, to other spaces? Well, I think um, the, the, you know quite often the premium spaces are in the, the big cities with the um, you know that are dependent on metro transit. So I mean I think theory, I think that's what we expect to happen, um, but it's a bit early to to really pick that up as a trend yet. Um, as you saw from the data, um, you, you know the the 
the Sunbelt cities, and the ones that the, the real differentiator at the moment is city uh, workplaces that can be accessed by car um, versus workplaces that are mainly accessed by uh, public transport. And um, it's quite interesting to, to note as well, um, even in, in New York, um, the, the car parks are, are, are jam packed. People want to get into the office in New York. But they're trying to drive in to do it. You can't get, you can't Uber in. You can't get car parking space. Um, so, a bit early to, to to make that that trend at the moment, except to say the the, the most discernible one. And there doesn't seem to be a, a CBD suburban trend emerging either. Um, it's mainly cities that depend on the car versus cities that depend on mass transit. Uh, good news for the Atlanta market then. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I, I, I just wanted, so, sorry, we're we're getting pretty close to the hour here, uh, so I, I just wanted to, to thank you for for all of this, Richard. It was it was really enlightening, uh, enlightening to see sort of what the data looks like on the ground there. Um, for for everybody that came, thanks for for joining. Our next meeting is going to be October twentieth. Uh, that's uh, and it'll be with uh, the AC's own Jonathan Smoke. Uh, and and uh, I believe Kayla is also joining from the from the board to talk about trends in the auto industry and some of the things that they're seeing there. So uh, th thanks everybody for attending. Thank you again, Richard, for for joining and, and giving us a talk. And I'll see you guys all next month.